Welcome to Downtown Dialogues. I am Adai Moon, and I am honored to be here with two very, very talented, talented artists. We have uh, Jason Menadakis, who is the artistic director at Marin Theater, and also the director of the wonderful play by Lauren Gunderson called The Catastrophist. And we also have the actor and star of that show, William Demerit, plays Dr. Nathan Wolf. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you for having us. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for having us. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yes, yeah, so let's just get started. Um, so, so, Jason, I, I was reading in the Times <laughs> that apparently the origins of this play were a text that you sent Lauren. <laughs> it is true. Tell me it a little true. bit about that. Um, it makes sense because well, I was cast via text message. So oh, really? That's that, what that makes sense. <laughs> oh, we see, true we see too. a pattern here. There's a pattern. And uh, some of the directing happened by text, and <laughs> some of the rewriting happened by text. And, oh, <laughs> um, yeah. So you know, when the when the pandemic happened, and um, you know, when the lockdown specifically when that happened, mm. um, you know, I was trying to figure out how were we going to move forward what was what was going to be the the sweet spot for us because everything we do at Marin is really focused around new American work now and we felt like that was critical um, for how we were going to move forward through the pandemic so the very first thing that I did was I reached out to Lauren because Lauren's our playwright in residence she lives here in San Francisco now um, and I reached out and I said you know I know this is crazy but <laughs> what would you think about adapting Nathan's book into something that lives somewhere between theater and film in the virtual realm, just in case this thing lasts a really long time? Yeah. And she said, just no. in case, just in case, yeah. just in case. <laughs> this is and, and she just flat out said no. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I, I, you know, this was all texting. So I was like, right. well, think about it. Cause you know, and, and so we had a few more back and forths uh, over, over time. And um, Lauren was really very hesitant about doing it until I guess she was thinking about how, it, I guess I got her to the point where she was actually like, all right, well, let me think about how I would do it if I actually thought about it. And when she realized that there was a frame that she could use, Mm -hmm. I think that's when she realized it was something she was interested in, but she immediately told me it wasn't going to be Nathan's book. It was going to be more about Nathan um, and his journey. And there would be a lot of the book in it because so much of the book is the work that Nathan has been doing for decades. Right. And so it was going to walk a line between being about Nathan mm -hmm. and she wouldn't tell me what the frame was. So I didn't know until I got, I, I really did not know until I got one of the very um, uh, fully fleshed out versions of the script, did I realize what the frame was and, and her way into this. Um, and the interesting thing is that Lauren's been our playwright in residence for five years. And one of the first things we talked about when we, when we started talking about, you know, how would she, you know, why would she be a, a playwright in residence with us? What, what was there? that I thought I could get out of her and what would she be able to provide to Marin? And, you know, the thing that I said is that I really wanted to find the play that was going to scare her when she was writing it. Wow. And I think it's maybe taken five years in a pandemic, but we found it for yeah. sure. Um, and her writing, as good as her writing has been, I really think as just pure writing, this went somewhere else. I, um, in I, terms I, of, of what she's been able to put, put down and what she's been able to create and the things she's been able to tap into. Um, and, and as much love as I have for this play, I can't wait to see what she writes next. Right. Because now that she's figured out a whole new way of sort of existing in, in her writing, I'm really excited to see where she goes. Um, cause I think, I think it's, it's the possibilities are endless for her right now. And, uh, and it's been really exciting to see how she's she's grown um, over this past year, really. Um, but but over the the years and years we've been working together as well. So that's great. So yeah. So 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 William, what was it like to step into a very 
intimate personal piece playing a man who's actually alive <laughs> and a brilliant scientist. Uh, what was your preparation like? Uh, yeah, okay, there's a lot. It's like like five questions in one. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, I will. No I will. I will try to. And Jason knows it's not going to work. I will try to answer you in like a linear way, but it's not. That's, that's not going to happen. That's fine. Um, so so there's the subject of one man shows. There's the subject of playing historical figures. Right? right. Nathan will be a historical figure, which is crazy to think of. Um, and then there's just the preparation, right? So I do have experience doing one man shows. Um, I wrote a one-man show called Origin Story that I might cajole Jason into directing at some point. Yeah. Um, but that's my only experience is doing something that I wrote, right? So right. in that case, when you mess up, you're like, ah, it's my life, so I'll just make it up. Right? <laughs> um, and then I have played historical figures, mostly writers. I played William Shakespeare uh, at Oregon Shakespeare Festival. I played Sholem Ash, the Yiddish writer at Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Um, and with those figures, they're either more obscure, like Sholem Ash, mm -hmm. or they're mythologized, like Shakespeare. So to some extent, no one can be like, oh, he didn't talk like that. It's like, well, how do you know? Right. Shakespeare wasn't black. I mean, okay, maybe he wasn't, but so what? <laughs> right? <laughs> you know? Um, and pro prove it. Prove it. Prove, prove it. it. <laughs> um, prove it. Everyone got something in there. Right? So... Uh, but I've never played a, a historical figure who's alive. Right. Right. And Nathan, although a wonderful, relatable human being, is a little intimidating with what he, the cape that he carries. Right. Right. Behind him. Uh, and I had a conversation with, with Lauren and Jason a few weeks into the rehearsal process because I, I, it became clear to me. So my, my, uh, my Yoda acting figure, right? Uh, Ron Van Lu, who was the head of NYU, then he was the head of Yale when I was at Yale. He told us to always make whole milk choices, mm. right? And I was kind of doing like a half and half choice. And, and I had to ask Lauren and Jason, I said, so wait, am I playing Nathan? Am I doing the whole like Daniel Day-Lewis situation here? Or <laughs> is, there, is there a character of Nathan that we are creating? And the two of them explained to me, no, it's, it's the latter. So that freed me up a lot. Right. I had to read the book, watch the TED Talks, talk to the man, ask a lot of questions, base it in the reality of the show and the reality of his life, but I'm not inhabiting his body. Right. Um, at the same time, there's already pressure when you're playing someone who was historical, who is alive, so people can actually go to YouTube and say, oh, no, he doesn't talk like that. Right. But Lauren and I are new friends, but we're close. So there's the responsibility of playing someone that you know who is also very dear to someone you care about. Mm -hmm. And you can't make things precious because then things break, but there's a kind of heightened awareness that I had to acknowledge and then sort of let go. Right? Because also I wasn't going to do anything that Lauren didn't write. So ultimately, if Nathan has a problem, it's, mm. um, <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> And then I think the thing that some of us take for granted that a lot of us enjoy when you're doing, whether it's a dance piece or musical theater or a film, you get this immediate, and sometimes it's false, but you get this immediate family that you're surrounded with for a given period of time, a matter of days or a matter of months or a matter of years. And Jason and Lauren and, and everyone went out of their way to make me feel at home. But I was alone by myself in a little apartment for three weeks. And then we had five days in the theater. And that was really the extent of my human contact with, with my collaborators. And that was weird. I'll bet. You know? And when I was rehearsing Origin Story, the show that I wrote, I had to kind of disconnect my writer brain and I could stop acting and have a conversation with the dramaturg about the director from like a writing point of view. But with this, Every time we were rehearsing, once the conversation was over, because Lauren is very collaborative and she was open to questions and maybe this line doesn't feel right in my mouth, so to speak. But when it was time to do the acting part of the rehearsal, it was just go. Mm. Right? And there's no breaks. And right or wrongly, in 
pretty much every rehearsal process I've been a part of, there's always a point in time where someone is marking, right? And I think we can we can use that kind of in, inside baseball terminology here, right? Right, right. And and sometimes that might be necessary. You know, it's not a good habit to get into, but but there was none of that, mm. which ultimately served me very well because we were supposed to have two weeks in the theater, and Jason and Marin have, um, I think, very responsibly and generously gone in a kind of social advocacy way with the theater. So they're doing a five day work week instead of the six day work week. So instead of having 10 days in the theater, because quarantine rules changed, we had five days in the theater to block tech, rehearse, shoot in five days. And that was my first time on stage uh, <laughs> since October of 2019. And it was my first time in front of a camera since February. That wasn't an audition. Right. Oh, wow. So there was a lot of anxiety and childlike wonder and what am I doing? Do I know how to do this? And there's no audience to give feedback. Um, and then I have to look in the camera, which goes against all the training that I've had. Right. And Jason is a great director. And in those moments where I kind of left myself, he would remind me that the way we rehearsed prepared me for this. Like I did it all. I know the arcs and the beats and all that. So just Alan Iverson, right? Like the reverse right, practice. Right. We practiced right. it. So, right. <laughs> that. Um, so I hope that is the long-winded answer to your question. Oh, no, that, that, that was perfect. That was perfect. So Jason, um, you and Lauren have been collaborating for Jesus. How long has it been now? <laughs> uh, well, when I moved to Atlanta in yeah. 2003, she was one of the first people I met and she was still a student at Emory and she mm -hmm. came up and came to a, a meeting at Actors Express and said, hi, I've been around Actors Express since I was seven. Right. When she did her first show there with Chris right. Coleman and, yeah. you know, and um, I'm now, a, I'm, I'm, you know, writing plays and I'm at Emory University and I, I want to be a playwright. I love this theater and let me know how I can help. And, I mean, that was my introduction to Lauren and, you know, we've been working together, you know, since then. Yeah. Um, we did some workshops of her plays in Atlanta and then uh, we started producing her here at Marin. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the one of the weirdest possible stories is that, you know, I brought her out here to do a workshop of a play called Rock Kill, American Gothic. And, uh, you know, she while she was here, she was staying at my house with Andrea and I. And she was like, you know, I've got a I've got a blind date I'm going to go on. And so she did that in the middle of the process. And guess who it was with? Whoa, I didn't know that story. Dr. Nathan Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Look at yeah. you bringing people together. Look at that. <laughs> no, I, I had not, nothing to do other than to, to bring her out here to do the workshop. She did all that. She knew she wanted to meet the guy. They had, uh, they had known each other over the internet. And, uh, you know, she had been following his work. And because of the science plays science that she stuff. writes, she was yeah. always interested. And so that's what's interesting is I think she was meeting him at a at a cross purposes of theater and science. And, right. you know, that's how they got to know each other. And then, you know, she ended up being married to him. He was not one of her subjects. And then all of a sudden he, uh, you know, he was. And right. <laughs> it's great to hear him tell it where he's like, you know, Where's my play? Where's my play? Wait, 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 what? Wait, what? Like, what? what? <laughs> no, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. I was just joking. So, um, yeah, I think it was, you know, he he's a very smart man. He said, you know, the playwright always gets the last word. So um, he was incredibly generous throughout the process. And uh, it's been really, it's been amazing to watch how Lauren has grown as a writer and as an artist. Um, the work that she's doing now, I mean, all over the world, uh, you know, she's working yeah. on the time traveler's wife right now with yeah, uh, that's, you know, going to be in London and, you know, she's, she's got uh, film and TV projects that are happening and just about everything that she writes right now, you know, people are looking to move into different mediums as well, which is super exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, it's just been, we've been so lucky to be on the ride with her. And uh, we still have at least one more world premiere coming from her this year, we hope. 
uh, if we can all get back into the theater by the end of the year. Uh, she and her writing, one of her writing partners, Margo Melcon, the third part of the Pemberley series. Uh -huh. So we're excited about that. And then, you know, we've got another year with her as, as her playwright in residence. Um, so uh, we're hoping for, for even more stuff down the pipe. So Yeah, before Hollywood takes her away from her. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So, uh, so where do you think the catastrophist sits within Lauren's body of work? If you had to look at the span of her work, um, it, well, it's certainly part of the science canon, and yeah. it's certainly sort of the exploration of great minds of science. Um, I think what's so interesting about this is her her science plays have always been removed. They've always been out of time, right? right. They've always been scientists from from different eras. And, you know, as Bill was saying, this is so different. I mean, for a minute, remove the fact that they're married. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just writing about someone who was alive and who's in the middle of their body of work and, you know, writing the way she did to kind of crack open both where we were in this moment but also from years back from 2006 when Nathan was in a very different place with the work that he was doing and the world was in a very different place in terms of their relationship to the work that he's doing it it was genius in how she decided to do it because she never talks about COVID right there's there's uh, not a line about COVID yeah. in the play right but we're allowed to think about where we are in the pandemic through someone who was thinking about what, what would happen if we ended up in a pandemic. So there's a lot of supposition that Nathan goes through in the play, if this, then this, and, and, you know, we're actually living it out now. Right. Right. And, and so um, I think that gave it a, an absolute immediacy that a lot of her work perhaps has in a very different way than, than the way it works in, in this piece. Right. Um, and the voice is, as a writer, is so authoritative in the way she found so many metaphorical containers in which to, to hide the story. Um, that was the thing that was just, for Bill and I, a lot of the conversation that we had in the rehearsal process was the 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 giddiness that we felt at knowing we were going to make this thing that we're going to have these numbers of reveals and where you know bill was at actually and i'm speaking for him and i apologize for that but there was this joy that he brings at the very beginning of the play when he when he realizes he's in a theater right. and he's in a safe space and the deconstruction of that that bill and i were able to play with yeah. to where that flips later right and the impact that it had on the character I mean it was so amazing to watch how Lauren had written that into the play and then how Bill was able to open it up and mm -hmm. to take something that that was a point of in some ways strength and confidence that almost bordered on arrogance then became something that flipped on him when he had to come to the realization of where he really was, right? right and right. and that the construct had been his own. Um, I mean, it was just, I mean, that sort of confidence in the writer to wrap inside and wrap inside. I mean, it did feel, you know, stepartian. I mean, that's where we felt like we were yeah. at times, yeah. right? Yeah. And, totally and someone, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's always totally. someone she's, you know, she's always compared to him. Yeah. And I Both think it's always do been it, sort of a, you know, it's always been sort of a, a, a real pull to, to compare these two writers. But I think with this piece, yeah. she came into her own in saying, I'm going to use this construct and this construct and I'm going to wrap them together. And there's going to be truth to both of them. Mm -hmm. But there's there's going to be a higher truth that's going to come out of them as we move through the piece. And um, and it, it again, it was just I mean, she she wrote this in like. I mean, it was literally the first draft of this really came out in about three months. In, he in, writes in wow. so in such a big dumbly form. fast. No, no, no. I mean, like Lauren's one of the fastest writers. Like Lauren and Kui Gwen are two of the fastest writers that I know. There, there was, so we were we were we were rehearsing on a Google Doc, uh -huh. 
Uh-huh. And there was one rehearsal I remember very specifically where she was <laughs> rewriting it as I was reading it aloud. Oh my God. <laughs> and I had to stop and say, Lauren, are you changing it because you're changing it or are you changing it because I suck? And, and to just backtrack 30 seconds, uh, so all the dramaturgical and like theater criticism points that Jason made Mm -hmm. and about Lauren's body of work and all that, I think there's sort of the obvious thing that needs to be said about in terms of where this lies in her work is, you know, as, as a writer, she's, she's not leaving theater, right. But she's definitely being, being pulled to like the bigger money TV movie jobs. Right. Right. And, and this play, this film, this, plume um is an innovation Mm. right the uk has been way ahead of us in terms of in terms of film theatrical experiences Mm -hmm. but a lot of those were stage plays that were then filmed right what happened with hamilton on disney plus was a stage musical that was expertly filmed right right but this was conceived as the beautiful bastard child of both Mm -hmm. and i think is very successful in serving both masters without sacrificing either. I've heard from many people, and I can't really judge it, right, because I'm in it, that it made them feel kind of like they were in a theater, but also like they were watching a good film, right? Um, so, So I think it's an important dot on the map in terms of her innovating something because it was always, my understanding is it was always written to be that. It wasn't written to only be a play or only be a film and jason you know and our team did a great job of of actualizing that for her yeah and, and yeah and, and that's leaning, absolutely true yeah leaning in on, on, on that uh the film you need to copyright that <laughs> you need to totally copyright that um so yeah we're, we're in a an interesting place with digital theater in general and so i would love to know from both of you even as it relates to the catastrophes, but also the things that we think about moving forward. Uh, what do you think is going on with this, this, uh, this digital theater film hybrid? Is it film? Is it theater? Without, Does it matter? <laughs> without, without um, sounding too braggadocious, I think all of us hope that the catastrophes can serve as a model, mm. right? improved upon yeah but right now with my limited imagination it's it's the the best genre of what we might need right because in in the beginning of the end times you know there are all these zoom plays and zoom readings and Mm -hmm. sometimes with the best of intentions sometimes maybe not uh instagram a lot of casting directors and such were having like monologue competitions and uh, scene classes and things and you know, currently I'm, I'm a guest artist at Interlochen this week, and I'm, I'm working on scenes from Fences with 14-year-olds uh, on Zoom. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> it's great, but it, it's limited. You know, and especially with something like Fences, you want to, uh, um, who said I got to like you? But, <laughs> I got to like you. <laughs> uh, you know, I think we're all, with very rare exception, done with Zoom readings, right? And Zoom, Zoom anything, practically. Right. You know, I'm happy to talk to you on this, but <laughs> right, Zoom in general, um, yeah, in, in general. <laughs> and and I, I'm not, and I don't shit on anyone who did it. Uh, I'm not interested in participating in, in a monologue competition on Instagram. Right. You know, I'm not interested in that. I wish you well, but that's not my thing. So, so we need something. And as I mentioned before, other countries, Europe, mm-hmm. many other countries in Europe, right? Europe's not a country, but you know what I mean. Um, they're ahead of us in terms of, because they, and I know it's like a liberal cliche talking out of my ass thing to say, but, but there seems to be a value that they place on art that we we don't (laughs) subsidy being one of them and earning a living and that is it. So whether look, and yeah, I would love for the catastrophes to get picked up by Netflix and for everyone to see it and for it to inspire lots of people. Right. But a lot of people are seeing it. Mm-hmm. So hopefully it can lead to something. I don't have, as I mentioned, the, the imagination to think of what the next thing could be. But, you know, yeah. 
How about you, Jason? Especially as an AD, I mean, what, what's it looking like in terms of this kind of programming going forward? Well, you know, the, the most exciting thing for us that has come out of this is the sheer number of people around the world that have been able to tap into it and have said, I love this. Is this what you normally do? Can I see more? And, you know, for us to say, well, this year you can for sure. And, you know, um, hopefully beyond that, yeah. because, you know, with the catastrophes, it's already been seen two weeks ago. And I, I don't have the updated zip codes and everything, but two weeks ago, it had been seen in 43 states and 10 countries. Whoa. I didn't know about the 10 countries. I know about a couple. Yeah. See, and that, 10 and countries. That's, and, and Jason, not, not to jump on you, but the thing is, yeah. is that, you know, what if every theater organization, whether it's the Schubert's or whether it's Marin, could have one show a year that's mm. either a separate show or like their hit show that is something made available in a high quality format digitally to make theater accessible. Yeah. Which helps and accessibility, right, is tied <coughs> to relevance. Because there are a lot of people out there from certain communities. Mm hmm who don't think theater is for them because theater has not been for them. Exactly. And when it has been for them, it hasn't always been accessible. Like one of the things I love about John Leguizamo is he always has tickets for mi gente, right? Like he always, right, right, right. he makes this 15 to $20 or whatever tickets available, you know? Um, so maybe, so accessibility is something that we've given. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if that was Jason's plan, right? But it's definitely a great model for that. Well, we got lucky because we did this on a SAG contract, right? And it would not have been the same contract if it had been on equity. Right. It would have been a very different arrangement where, you know, if it had been through equity and and we had done it as, as a theater piece as opposed to a film, because we shot it as a film, um, we would have, you know, the, the release would have been very different. It would have been a limited number of weeks as opposed to the, you know, the 26 week period that we have uh, in the initial agreement between ourselves and Bill and everybody that's involved. And so what we've been able to do is to make this piece available. We have 11 theater partners right now. Right. And, the actual and outfit schools, is we're, one also, of them. we're also doing school uh, yeah. deals. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so, you know, it's theatrical outfit is showing it virginia stage is showing it you know where my parents happen to live in virginia beach so my parents are able to see it oh, you know cool. through their their own community and then um you know it's all over the place right now um which is great and what we're trying to figure out is how do we do this going forward how do we do this so that you know on a nightly basis mm -hmm. people from wherever can can see what we're doing and I think that is going to be a way for the arts to move into a more sustainable format is that if we can have subscribers all over the country and if we can't have subscribers that are all over the world in different cities that that regularly, you know, buy the digital subscription so they can see the, the digital version of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and whether that's a recorded piece that's available that we make of the live piece or whether it's a live streaming piece that we figure out you know, the technology to make that actually happen. Um, I think the, if, if we can figure out how to make it make sense for all the different partners that are involved in terms of the different unions and the different artists and the different artisans and the people, everybody who's working on it, if we can make everybody's boat rise by figuring out how to make this get outside of our walls, right. that would really, really, really help. And, um, and I, I also... Love no, yeah, and I never want to go back to the limited availability that you have to come to our our space. I mean, just in the Bay Area alone, right? So much of our work, we've been partnering with different theater companies to actually move work around the city. When we did How I Learned What I Learned, uh -huh. we partnered with Lorraine Hansberry uh, Theater in San Francisco and with the Ubuntu Theater Project in Oakland right. because we knew – that with the problems in, in the Bay Area in terms of just people moving from work time to uh, downtime, right? To get from, from where people work to their home, then to get to the theater, people from Oakland getting to, to Mill Valley, it, you gotta go one or two bridges to make right. it work, right. right? And it's 40 miles in rush hour traffic because rush hour traffic starts at two and goes till seven, 
So, you know, are people even going to be able to do it? So we've been trying to figure out how to take work to people. And now people can be a part of the work no matter where they are. Right. And also and, if we, if we do it digitally, like, cause if you're, if you're taking the, the train from Westchester into Manhattan, or if you and your family are planning a weekend in Ashland, so you can go to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival or, right. you know, go to St. Louis rap or whatever weekend you have to spend. Right. That, that better be a show. You better exactly. be in there for like, <laughs> you better be in there for like three hours and there need to be some effects or like a Morgan Freeman voiceover, or you better be seeing, you know, Laura Linney or something. Right. Right. But, for a digital thing for 10, 20, 30 dollars, depending on the show, you can make an 80 minute piece. You can. You can make a couple 30 minute pieces. Right? Um, so so it's not just accessibility in terms of affordability, but as Jason's intimating, you know, modern day and who knows what the commuter life is gonna be like in twenty twenty two, right? right. <laughs> or at the right. end of this right. year. But if you have kids and you live in San Francisco, you know, you, you can't necessarily go spend three hours at a theater and you know, it, it, and even like go to a ball game, right? How much does it cost to go to a ball game now with your family? Right. You know? Yeah. So, so there's a lot of advantages, and I love Jason touched on the union thing, which I think we should touch on. I'm not going to go on all things, but I love my unions, right? My unions keep me literally you keep me alive, right? Right. If I did not have have healthcare, there'd be some real problems. Yeah. But equity is really slow. Like the theater in general is always really slow to adapt to change. Yeah. Whether it's theater education being like, oh, black playwrights, Asian playwrights, what? Right. Um, whether it's like, oh, not everything is Stanislavski. Love Stanislavski. Not everything is Stanislavski. Um, and, and, you know, SAG has its own problems, but, but, it, it, but film and theater and TV, sorry, film and, and TV and, and that union and the people involved in creating film and TV seem to be a little bit quicker to, to adapt and adjust and try new things. And I think now equity has taken over contracts for things like this. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but as Jason is talking about with the time limitations of how long something can live, that doesn't benefit anyone. Mm. Like we have to be protected, right? I don't want people bootlegging this or taping this or, you know, and I need to make sure that I get my, my residuals, right, for my health care and, you know, put food on the table and all that. Right. But um, the contract we're working on, uh, I'm working under for SAG with this is, been really great for me, <laughs> you know, and I really appreciate uh, Marin taking the time to iron that out. Um, yeah. 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 So, and the great thing about this is we're going to be able to use this as an educational piece forever. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Do you know what I mean? Definitely. I mean, you know, in 10 I was Googling years when the whole like, time. I was Googling stuff the entire time. I was like, wait, pause. Hey, you can pause it and be like, Wait, prokaryotes. Oh, 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 oh. Exactly. I know you exp I know you explained it, but I need Neil deGrasse to like tell me about this for a second. I need Bill Nye to like elaborate on this. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, as, as an educational piece, it's timeless. Yeah. Because we will always, so. uh, you know, according to Nathan, we will always have pandemics. <laughs> and, and Jason and La Jason and Lauren have, have told me, and whether it's with me or not, I don't know, but they would love to do this live at some point. Oh, that'd right? be great. And I think that while the show is an amazing time capsule of, man, when we sit down with our grandkids and we tell them about 2020, 2021, and they're right. like, what? It's an amazing time capsule, but I think because of how it's written and Nathan's ongoing struggle, right? The great, the great human sort of hubris of planning for disaster, but overlooking your own disaster. Yeah. Um, I, I hope that the piece is timeless, whether it's that film or the script or both. Um, so I'm curious to see what kind of longevity it has a time capsule and a piece of relevancy has, which I think will be a long one. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, my last question, um, how has, um, the pandemic altered or impacted whether in positive ways or negative way, your, your artistic practice, how's it changed it? You want to go first? Sure. Um, I was actually just reading something, uh, National Geographic. I'm, I'm a procrastinator. Uh, a generous person will say it's because I'm a perfectionist, right? Um, so hence nothing gets done because if I don't do it, it can't go wrong, right? I was, look, I was very lucky in that the first part of the pandemic, I was very busy. And in this latter half, or what is now the latter, I mean, who knows? Uh, because of the catastrophist, I was also very busy. Right. 
there was a chunk of time in the middle. Um, and I'm, I'm a native New Yorker. I'm in my studio apartment now. I've learned the value of outdoor space. Mm. And I have found it very difficult to be creative when I don't have space. Um, and something, you know, that I think I knew sort of in my reptile brain, but I needed National Geographic to spell it out for me, is not having a space that is solely for work, which I can't have because of how small my apartment is, really fucks with the creative process. Yes, it does. And then, you know, my wife, she's creative. She does things too. And some things can't be done at the same time. Um, I've started writing a lot more. <laughs> so... Um, I, I've learned the value of time for myself, both productively and unproductively. Space, how to force myself to be creative in other ways, like mm -hmm. the writing. Um, and how important it is for me to be a working artist. You know, beyond the food on the table situation, I, I'm the sort of person, if you put me in an office, it's not going to go well for anyone. Right. <laughs> right. Let's right. just not, unless you want a sociological experiment, like there's no fucking point. Don't do it. Um, but there's nothing else there, that I can functionally do mm. and either contribute to society or, or feel fulfilled. Right. Um, and it's hard because, you know, right now, what's happening for me is writing and auditions. Not this week, auditions, but generally speaking. Right. And and a lot of the anxiety is gone because it's like, this is actually my chance to act right, right, today. Right. It feels a little bit more like throwing pebbles into the Atlantic than it usually does. You just guys, hello, hello, hello. Um, but um, I, I'm starting to feel very at one time optimistic and at one time deeply uncertain mm. about what life is going to look like on the other side of this. Because right. I actually can't conceive of it. Like I, I, I usually I feel better if I can have an idea, mm -hmm. if I can draw the scene out in my head a little bit, not in the terms of a plan, but just like sort of, and I, I have no, I have no idea. Right. How about you, Jason? How's it? shifted for you you know it um a friend of mine who runs san diego rep sam woodhouse i think described what's been going on with a lot of ad's uh artistic directors really well when he said you know what makes us unique is that we can conceive of something from from literally the paper and and the the imagination that someone puts down on paper, we can conceive the whole thing mm -hmm. and find it not just in conceptually, but we can place it in space time of from here to there. Like this is going to be opening night. And this is what it's going to take to get from here to here. And that does not exist anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. And, wow. and we've had to reconceive how to do that. And I think the biggest thing for me has been the pandemic combined with the demands from We See You White American Theater right. to make a more just and humane American theater, world theater, hopefully, international theater. Um, but the trying to, to decentralize that idea that I can conceive of it from, from this point to that point and mm -hmm. how can others conceive of it from here to here, I think has right. been the biggest change for me as an artistic director. I'm, you know, the project that we're doing now, we were, that we're in the middle of, um, everyone I've described to has literally told me I'm insane for even thinking about it this way, but we invested a large amount of money into an artist and the company that that artist created to do the first two phases of a four phase project oh, wow. that includes live on stage performance, film performance, like what we did for the catastrophist and digital interactive 
kind of almost gaming. Oh, wow. Huh. And all, all three pieces are going to be put together in one roughly an hour or more experience. Right. That is, is going to have branching narratives inside of it. And we take over the project when it comes to the theater. Everything filmed, everything digitized and made into this digital interactive experience and the platforms brought to us. We put the actor on stage and then we create all this branching stuff that happens off of that live performance. Uh -huh. And we have zero control uh -huh. over what's going to show up the day we walk into the theater. <laughs> Wow. And and it's a it's it's exactly what was asked for, right? Where where folks were like, invest in invest. Right. Trust our artistic vision, trust right how this process is gonna go. And let's see if we can make something bigger than what you can conceive of from here to here. And we're we're trying that. Mm -hmm. And I, I even think it's going to be a combination of SAG contracts for everything that happens prior to moving into the theater and equity contracts when we move into the theater. Right. Oh, wow. So it's... Ooh. Yeah. That, that sounds like the future, man. <laughs> that sounds like the future. That's it's going awesome. to it's gonna be live every night. And the, there's all this filmed and interactive stuff that's going to happen that the live actor is going to be taking you on a journey and then you go off somewhere else and then you'll come back to him on stage um but yeah we'll see okay yes yeah, so i'm gonna have to make a little trip out there when, when this launches <laughs> you're gonna it's all digital oh so it's nobody's all gonna be in the theater nobody's oh. in the theater so you'll watch him live through either your smart tv or your computer or whatever and you'll be sent into film and then you'll be sent into a digital thing and you'll be able to click on the drawer and the drawer will open and there'll be a letter and you can read the letter or you can go open the closet and Super. you'll find out different stuff about the journey based on what you decide to do i it's mean it's an all immersive experience that yeah, sounds with, without um giving it away right there was a, a version of this of the catastrophe where lauren had written in the script kind of an audience participation yeah i read uh, that that version right. of it where, the where, where the, whoever bought the ticket let's just use the word the subscriber right or the uh, ticket by the audience would have received in the mail or would have been told to get these things mm -hmm. and you know for the type of thing jason's talking about like yeah man maybe there's a version of that where you buy a ticket and they send you a, a little box right and you know you explore that box when prompted in the show i mean right i said my imagination is not so good right now but that's our only limit with this stuff at this point Exactly. And, you know, uh, I, as a fan of immersive theater, that this sounds exciting. Congratulations, man. I can't wait to experience it. Yeah. So again, it's, it's less, I mean, it's, it's really been less what I've come up with and more of giving artists a lot more space and a lot more, uh, a lot more resource right? Um, and backing to, to, to follow their inspiration because and i think it, it gets at a little bit of what's been always holding us back with the unions is the is the idea of it'll run away too fast if mm. we let too many people get too creative right and we've always tried to keep it controlled and keep it and i think that's why we haven't been able to figure out how to make it more accessible mm -hmm. and more profitable for the actors and the artists and the people who are making it and i think that hopefully is what the pandemic combined with the movements that have happened within this past year. Right. Hopefully that's where all of this goes is giving a lot more people, a lot more opportunity to turn their art into sustainability for themselves. So. Definitely. Well, I, I want to thank both of you for creating this amazing, engaging, innovative piece of work, uh, the catastrophist and for allowing theatrical outfit to be a part of this process uh, it's, it's a great honor i'm very well happy thank you for having you. us yeah man thank you for having us yeah and it's good to be back in front of atlanta audiences too oh yeah, yeah i bet <laughs> pretty wild it's pretty wild awesome thanks guys yeah thank thanks you thanks to die